Today we're going to be talking about electrophoresis, one of the main separation techniques that a forensic scientist will use for samples that chromatography is not much useful. So we'll be going over the principles and also the applications to forensics. So firstly, a little bit of background about what electrophoresis is. Just like chromatography, electrophoresis is a separation technique, but it's a complementary technique to analyze a whole range of different samples that chromatography is not very useful for, like amino acids and DNA. And so the basis of electrophoresis is to separate charged particles by the application or the use of a voltage or an electric field. It has forensic applications in terms of analyzing and separating amino acids and also uh, fragments of DNA to prepare a DNA profile or DNA fingerprint. So some of the key vocabulary that we're going to be looking at is the idea of amphoteric and amphiprotic nature of amino acids, looking at zwitter ions, the isoelectric point, migration, anode and cathode. So going back and doing some revision about amino acids. So far we've recognised that amino acids are both amphoteric and amphiprotic. Amphoteric being able to react with both acid and base because of both functional groups and also amphiprotic able to both give and receive protons. And in solution, if we take an amino acid, it can have an, a net positive charge, a net negative charge, or a net charge of zero. You can see in the examples underneath there, we have the cation on the left, we have the anion on the right, and the neutral zwitter ion structure in the middle, which has both positive and negative charges, making it neutral overall. We've also talked about the concept of the isoelectric point, which that is, for each amino acid, there exists a specific pH which we call its isoelectric point, where the amino acid exists in this neutral zwitter ion form. Below this pH, or at more acidic pHs, the amino acid exists in its cationic form, and above it exists in its anionic form. And we've also seen the idea that the, the, the different form of the amino acids is pH dependent. So if we take the given structure that we see in the top left, that in, at some point in the middle, at its isoelectric point, that the zwitter ion predominates. That's the form that we would find. If we take the pH and increase it to make it higher and more basic, then the anionic form predominates. All available protons have been stripped away. Whereas if we start in that middle and we move towards the acidic pH end, all available protons have been, uh, protons are filling every available space, and so the cationic form predominates. And that point in the middle is our isoelectric point which is specific to each amino acid, different, but also well known. So we, we've measured it for each of the amino acids that are available in nature. So the first um, process that we're going to look at is the concept of paper electrophoresis, the first of two main techniques. So for paper electrophoresis, which we would use for amino acids or proteins, we use a strip of porous paper like we would use for paper chromatography that's immersed in a buffer solution. Now the buffer solution, its role is to control and maintain a specific pH. That's kind of where the knowledge about the isoelectric point comes in. And so the samples that we're testing are placed in the middle of the paper. And then... <coughs> so now we're going to start thinking about uh, the application of forensics in terms of the um, analysis of amino acids and proteins. So the first process that we have to do is we have to break the protein down or hydrolyze it into its constituent amino acids because the protein strand itself is way too large and too bulky and long to be effectively analyzed by this technique. But if we can break it or chop it into its intersections, into its amino acids, we can use that information to analyze and identify how the protein is put together. So it needs to be hydrolyzed first. We then take our samples, which may be pure samples of particular amino acids or the mixtures that we're testing, and they're loaded into the centre of the paper, which is one of the key features of this technique. The two different electrodes, the anode and the cathode, are placed at opposite ends of the container, and then the voltage is applied from a power source, like a 9-volt battery or a power pack. Based on both their charge and their size, amino acids will migrate either to one end or the other, or also they can remain at the starting point. And so the net charge of the amino acid molecule determines the direction that it migrates in the electric field. At which, which way does it move? Does it move towards the positive electrode, the negative electrode, or does it stay put? And so we see that the cationic form 
um, migrates towards the cathode, Cato cathode and cation. That's where the origin of the name comes from. Okay, the positively charged ion will be attracted to the negatively charged electrode. Likewise, that we can see the anode, which is positively charged, that anions are attracted to the anode. The anionic form, which is negatively charged, will be attracted to the positively charged electrode. And then when we have the Zwitter ion in the middle, which has a net charge of zero, it's not attracted to either electrode and stays put. And now we move on to think about the second type of electrophoresis or gel electrophoresis. You can see the sort, an example of the setup in the image on the right. This is the type of technique we would use for DNA. Um, it, instead of paper, the porous paper, it uses a type of gel, which might be polyacrylamide, a specific type of polymer, or agarose, like it used to prepare an agar plate for bacteria cultures. We would also use a buffer solution for the same reason as before, to help conduct charge and also to maintain a specific pH. Samples are loaded at one end of the gel, and then we apply the voltage. The, we get the separation for DNA fragments based on both their size and their charge. Now, in a moment, I'll explain why we only load the samples at one end. Because ultimately, DNA fragments, once we break it into sections, are all negatively charged. So that means that charge alone cannot separate DNA. That it, unlike with amino acids where they may have different charges, that when they all have the same type of charge, they will all migrate towards the anode, the positive electrode. But the thing is, that because we have fragments of different size and length, that they will migrate to different extents due to that size. That the size of the fragment will dictate the distance it travels. The larger the fragment is, the slower it will travel in a given time frame. And so that's the basis that we can separate the fragments of DNA. So you can see um, an example kind of set up in the image on the right, where we would put a mixture of DNA fragments of different sizes, up towards the negatively charged electrode and they will be repelled by that electrode and attracted towards the positively charged electrode separating out as they go. So we load the samples onto the agarose gel at one end. The anode and the cathode are placed at opposite ends of the gel and then we apply the voltage. The negatively charged fragments move through that matrix, that through that thick gel towards the positive electrode. Now, the shorter molecules or the shorter fragments move through the gel more easily. That is, they move further and faster than larger molecules in that particular time that we would apply it. The reason that that works is that um, the gel is very tightly packed. There's only really narrow spaces in between the different, the, the different molecules that make up its structure. And so the size of the particles is really going to affect how quickly and how easily it fits through those spaces. Um, an analogy that might help would be thinking about moving through a crowded room at a party. When you're one person moving through the room, it can be difficult and uncomfortable, but you can find spaces between people relatively easily. It's not that hard to make your way from one side of the room to the other by picking the gaps. Whereas if you are a group of six, eight, 10, 12, you name it, pick a size, a large group of people who has to stick together, cannot come unstuck, then it's much harder for that group to actually make their way through all of those gaps in the in the crowd to be able to to find their way through from point a to point b it's slower and more difficult and so this is the same sort of basis for separation of dna fragments okay so we can see that we um we load up our samples at one end um, up near that cathode over time that the bands made up of different fragments start to spread out and then eventually that we end up with separate bands in the completed gel you can see on the right, where the longer or larger molecule fragments um, are closer to the starting point, they haven't traveled as far versus the shorter components which have traveled a lot further. So now overall, we can look at the different factors that will affect how things separate with electrophoresis. So we can divide them into two main areas. We can think about internal and external factors. So internal factors have to do with the actual particles themselves, the size of the fragment, some of their specific properties. In a moment, we'll look at external factors which have to do with the environment. So the speed and direction that a charged particle will move in the field will be determined by, firstly, its net charge. Is it positive, neutral, or negative? 
And if it does have a positive or negative charge, how many positives or negatives does it have? Is it plus one, plus two, plus three, minus one, minus two, minus three? Because that's all also going to impact um, how quickly it moves. Um, now the net charge, as we saw before, is determined by the pH. The, the pH of the buffer solution that we choose to put in will affect which form predominates. And so we can use that to our advantage to be able to make amino acids move in one particular direction or another. Now the increase in charge, the greater the charge is, the faster speed that it moves through the gel or through the matrix towards the oppositely charged electrode. Now remember, it's not just based on charge, it's also based on size and shape, especially with DNA. So increasing size translates into a slower speed or a shorter distance in a given time frame. And it's also affected by external factors to do with the environment. So first one would be voltage. As we increase the voltage, we will increase the speed because we increase the attraction of the charged particles to the electrode on the other side. And also the repulsion, in the case of DNA, the repulsion from the negative electrode as well. Uh, it's also affected by the buffer pH because that will determine the net charge on the particle itself and therefore its direction. The support medium, that is the type of gel or the type of paper, um, is going to affect the speed because the more it interacts with the gel or the narrower those spaces are, the longer it will take. And also we have temperature. As we increase the temperature, then we're also going to increase the speed. So that's some of the information that we have about electrophoresis as a separation technique in forensic science.